It doesn't, it doesn't like the screen share. But as soon as I go into screen the screen share on tea, it's not the presentation, which is great. So we might just have to go to that. Uh, but it's only me yourself here and here. Uh, so we literally go share screen. Yeah, so if I jump back in. Yeah, so I can't go to the screen. What's your role? Yes, it should be a five. Literally. Like that one. It tries this. Okay. Maybe she's going to. I think we're just going to. Don't worry. I'm sure. Yeah, I'll just leave it to you, Okay. Um, just hand to you, kind of edge on to talk about data. Yeah. So, um, to be just cut quick through the three steps. Yeah. Yeah. You can leave Archer with me. As long as in this room. <laughs> all right guys so uh welcome to our power bi brand meetup thank you all so much for coming along it's good to see you all here so for those of you that are new to power bi brand this is something that's originated over from our office in manchester so alex taylor who some of you might know um the director of bi data analytics there started the user group six years ago. Uh, we now have a group in Leeds uh, and now in Birmingham, which we started in February. So why attend? The user groups are a great way to network, grow your skills and discover opportunities. Most importantly, have fun. Um, with each meeting, speakers and attendees alike share best practices, practical takeaways and real world success stories. In terms of BI and data, so if anyone is seeking a new role um, or if anyone's looking to hire, if you want to come and find me, uh, more than happy to give any advice on the market at the moment, uh, kind of trends, what you're going to be finding, um, and just give some career advice, really, as best I can. So we'll do the quick intro. Um, I'm also going to hand over to John, um, who is going to be speaking about data relay, which is going to be taking place in October. Just um, to be fair, John, if you want to get a quick word about that now, yeah. uh, and then we can carry on from there. Uh, who likes free training? <laughs> Cool. Uh, I'm here in circle for QR codes. Uh, data relay, it's at the uh, Odeon Broadway in October. It's Birmingham and um, the place is secure, not local. Uh, free training, closed sessions, someone pay BI, someone day, it's a secret server. Uh, we'll be announcing the agenda soon, so keep an eye out on um, uh, data relay web page, Twitter, every data relay, all the details. Are there. Scan it, it's completely free. You also get a free lunch as well, sandwich. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to it four times, it's well worth it. Yeah, it's because I've won an Amazon voucher last night. It's really worth it. 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 It's really worth so yeah, thanks for that, John. Um, so yeah, we'll start with Leon, who's going to be doing machine learning in Power BI. Uh, we'll have a short break for uh, some pizza, and then we'll hand over to Kieran, who's going to be dialing in remote. Um, he's going to be showing us exploring free Microsoft Fabric. Uh, we'll finish up about eight o'clock, um, but once Leon's done, he'll do a bit of time for Q&A, uh, and the same with Kieran as well. 
So the upcoming meetups. So Thursday, the 24th of August, we've got Matthias and NJ will be joining us. Uh, the venue and topics are to be confirmed. We'll be confirming those next week. So if you keep an eye on the meetup, um, and we'll be able to let you know. And then Thursday, the 21st, still deciding on who uh, and where we're going to be presenting that. Um, so yeah, if you just keep your eyes peeled. And then as ever, um, if anybody knows any venues who would be willing to let us host there, uh, we'd be more than happy to have a conversation. Uh, and if anybody knows anyone who would like to speak at one of our meetups, uh, we'd really appreciate you if you just come and find me and let us know. But yeah, thank you all so much for coming. And I'll hand you over to Leon. Thank you. OK, good evening, everybody. And today we're going to be going through machine learning in Power BI. OK, it's going to be I'll give you a few caveats. First and foremost is it's going to be a very demo driven session. Uh, we're going to explore machine learning across um, the, the board in Power BI. So we're going to start with uh, Power BI premium per user and how you can do it using the traditional method uh, using the service. Then we're going to look at how you can do this for free in either Power BI Desktop or Power BI Pro. And I'm going to gloss over a lot of the technical aspects. So this is going to be more of an art of the possible session as opposed to um, a deep technical deep dive or tutorial. OK, um, so a very brief bit about me. So um, as we mentioned, my name is Leon Gordon. I'm a current Microsoft uh, Data Platform MVP. Um, please feel free to scan the QR code and connect with me. Um, I'm also the founder and CEO of a data consultancy called Onyx Data. Um, and I'm also the founder of the Microsoft Fabric UK user group. So how many of you are members of the Fabric UK user group on LinkedIn? Quick show of hands. Right, we need more, all right? <laughs> We're nearly 10,000 people strong on LinkedIn. Uh, so please do come and join us. We hold, at the moment, bi-weekly uh, webinars full of MVPs, great tutorials. Uh, they're streamed live on LinkedIn, YouTube and Facebook. So come and join us there. Um, outside of that, how many people here use Power BI? Yeah. Um, how many of you have had the opportunity to win $300 worth of Amazon vouchers this month? <laughs> right. OK, so come and join us at the Data DNA data set visualization group as well. Every month we hand out a free data set. It's a very lightweight data set. It's a single table, so you don't have to worry about modeling, joins, etc. It's supposed to be lightweight. Um, you can visualize it in any tool of your choice, and um, the winner has the opportunity to win $300 dollars worth of Amazon vouchers every single month. OK, it's free to enter, um, so please do come and join us there. Um, outside of that, I also contribute regularly to uh, to the Forbes Technology Council and uh, Brains Magazine as well. So with the introductions out of the way, let's take a look at what we will cover today. So first and foremost, I'll give a brief introduction in terms of what is machine learning, um, often referred to as ML, how we can benefit from ML in Power BI, how to create a machine learning model in Power BI uh, using Power BI Premium or Premium Per User, which is often referred to as PPU. Um, and then we'll look at how to create a machine learning model in Power BI for free. And I'll leave you with some resources to continue learning at the end as well. Um, just before we do go into it, can I just double check that everybody can hear me fine at the back? Excellent, perfect. So first and foremost, what is machine learning? So machine learning is a branch of artificial intelligence, um, often referred to as AI, that teaches computers to do what comes naturally to humans, which is to learn from experience. Machine learning algorithms use computational methods to learn information directly from data without relying on a predetermined equation as a model. Now, that is a very worthy way of saying we're going to make sure the computer can learn from experience and learn information directly from data. OK. Now, with that being said, there are a couple of ways that we can benefit from machine learning in Power BI. Okay. Now we can look to do real time predictions. Um, I was speaking to John earlier about customer churn analysis, for example. Uh, we can do customer lead and conversion. We can also look at predicting fraud and one of my favorites, which is predicting house prices as well. Um, in today's example, we're going to take a look at how we can um, predict customer leads and conversions, and we're going to do it on a real life or a fictitious scenario of a business problem. OK, so just before we do go into that uh, again, quick show of hands, please. Um, who is familiar with machine learning? Excellent. Who has used machine learning? Fantastic. And who wants to learn more about machine learning? Excellent. We're all talking my language. So today's problem is we're talking about a fictitious organization and we can see that we have 
the traditional sales funnel here. So we start off with a set of leads, okay? Our leads then receive a sales call. Um, if we're lucky, we'll then get to give a follow-up call to that person. We will then go through and ultimately make a conversion and a sale. Now, generally, as you start to go down this funnel, you start with a lot of leads and then you end up with hopefully just a few sales off the back of it. Now, for this organization, they were actually spending roughly around three million pounds per year on purchasing leads. OK, now out of these leads, they were getting a four point three percent conversion rate, which for the purpose of this demo, we're going to say is not very good. So their problem here is twofold. They're spending a large amount of money every year on leads, and they're also not converting a lot into sales. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we could use Power BI to ultimately either decrease their spend on leads or optimize it so they're purchasing the right leads and ultimately push that conversion rate up higher as well so they generate more revenue through sales. And today we're going to take a look at how we can do that. So we're going to see how we can use machine learning in Power BI. And don't worry, even though um, the robot doesn't look too happy, no machines were harmed in making of this demo. OK, and as I mentioned, it is going to be very demo intensive, so please just do hold fire on questions um, as we go through. So first and foremost, um, I will give you the link to our GitHub uh, following this session. There will be a QR code and please just ask me after for it where you get access to everything I'm going to go through in terms of data sets, scripts, etc. OK, and slides as well. So in here we've got two CSV files, OK? One is our prospective buyer CSV, and we also have a sales training CSV. OK, now our prospective buyer CSV is ultimately um, actually let's start with our. Yeah, let's start with our. Training CSV, OK, so if we start with our sales training, you'll see within this data that we have um, customer information, so we have a customer's age, their marital status, their gender, their yearly income, the total amount of children, the number of children left at home, their education, occupation, whether or not they're a homeowner or not, the Boolean flag, um, number of cars owned, their state province code, their postal code. And as this is our existing customer data, we have this column at the end here, which hopefully you can all see, uh, which is the bio column. Again, a Boolean value to say whether or not this individual was a customer of ours or not. And this is what we're going to use as our training set to train our machine learning model. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to open up the raw version of that, and we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, we have a second data set, which is called our prospective buyer CSV. Now we can tell this comes from um, some form of transactional system because we have a prospective buyer key and an alternate key as our first two columns. In this case, we have a first name and the last name, uh, which are all fictional, just the GDPR and PIR. Uh, this is dummy data. Um, and then we have very common columns to our um, customer data set. So we have age, marital status, gender, yearly income, so on and so forth, until ultimately, You'll notice that at the end we don't have a buyer column because this is lead data. We haven't contacted any of these individuals yet. They haven't been a buyer or potentially um, not a customer for us. OK, so first and foremost, let's open this up in raw again as well. OK, and let's head over to the Power BI service. Now you'll notice that in this demo, I'm going to use um, one of the premium PPU. Uh, workspaces. Kieran's going to do a demo on Fabric later, so I'm not going to go into anything to do with Fabric this evening. OK, so I have an existing um, sandbox workspace. So we'll just log in to there. OK, and what I want to do in this example is create a new. Data flow. OK. Now, the reason I want to do this is I want to ingest my data from those CSVs directly into a data flow so then I can start to use the cognitive services and machine learning capabilities. OK, so to do this, we want to define new tables. OK, so we go ahead and select add new tables. And what we want to do is select t text CSV as our data source. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Power Query Online. So what I'm going to do is just go back to our raw files. I'm just going to grab both of our URLs from there. Now what we're going to do is just copy and paste our URLs directly 
uh, in our link to file. So for our file path, our URL, and we're going to select next. Now, what will happen here? Everybody that's familiar with Power Query, uh, Power Query is actually passing the data within that CSV, and it's actually previewing back to us the first 200 rows worth of that data. Um, and it's you can see here at the top, it's accurately detected that our first row is actually our column headers, and you'll see that it started to label some of our data types as well. So we have strings here and we have um, a few whole numbers, et cetera, as we go through. So in this instance, we don't need to make any transformations to this data, but we do have to select transform data, and then we do have to select um, save and close. Now, you can actually add our second table at that screen as well, but I think it's easier to show you how to add um, another table once you come out and go back in, okay? So let's call this, um, ML from now what I would suggest is working in development you always should leave a description um, on any objects that you create within any environment um, if not just for your colleagues then for your future selves as well when you come back take a look so for the purposes of this I'm just going to write this is a description but please do ensure that you use um, a more legible description for your colleagues and yourself um, when defining these in the future now how the I will ask us if we want to either refresh our data flow now or create a refresh schedule. I don't for the purposes of today's demo. So we're going to carry on and select add tables at the top right here. So we have our prospective buyer data. Now we're going to follow exactly the same process to load in our sales training data. OK, so we'll just go in. Select the URL. Once again, Power Query Online will just pass the data within that CSV, um, predict base, back to us based on the first 200 rows. And again, you'll notice that the top row um, is clearly defined as headers, and we still have um, some of our values uh, being defined in terms of data types at the top here as well. Once again, for the purpose of this demo, I'm not going to do any transformations. We'll go through and we will save and close. Now, I make that about I'm going to say five, six minutes, and we have our data loaded into our data flow um, and defined within um, our, our, our Power BI data flow. Like I say, we're not going to um, refresh the data or set a refresh schedule. What we are going to do is, if you see at the top here, we have machine learning models available to us. OK, now we're going to go ahead and select that. And for everybody that sees all of the buzz around AI, ChatGPT, OpenAI, machine learning, as you'll see here, there's nothing to be afraid of. We're going to walk through in approximately five different steps, and we're going to build out a machine learning model that predicts lead conversion, okay? So to do this, first and foremost, we're going to create and train our model, and we're going to do that by selecting our training data, choosing a model type, ultimately training our model, before moving on to improving our model, and then finally, applying our model to our lead data. So actually making those predictions on our data. So let's go ahead and get started. Excellent. So walking through the wizard, first of all, we are asked, what do we want to predict? Now, you may remember at the top end of the session, I said that we wanted to predict whether or not an individual, so from our training data, because remember we're building our model, we're building our predictions and training, we want to predict from that data whether or not an individual will be a buyer. OK, so we can go ahead and select next. Now, again, in the background, the data will be passed and Power BI will start to make some predictions um, in terms of which model it feels that we should use to base our predictions on. OK, now in this scenario, um, they're recommending, as you can see at the top here, that we use a binary prediction model. And just as we can see defined on the left hand side, a binary prediction model predicts whether or not an outcome will be achieved, which is perfect for us to understand whether or not an individual will be a buyer or not a buyer. OK, so if that wasn't the case, we can go here and select um, a different model. OK, just by selecting there, you'll notice now that we have a grouping in terms of machine learning models, whether it's classification or regression, you'll notice that we have binary prediction, which was already recommended to us. And if we hover over that, it will give you an example as well. So it's telling us that binary prediction determines the likelihood of a sales lead converting 
or the probability of a customer responding to a marketing campaign. So I would suggest that Power BI is right in this instance in terms of its recommendation, but we could also select general classification, which is distinguishing between two or three outcomes or three or more outcomes. And this is generally used, as we said previously, for predicting credit card, uh, whether people have good, bad credit, um, for example. And then finally, we have my favorite, which is regression, uh, as I mentioned before, in terms of estimating house prices, et cetera. That's generally what you would use regression for. As I mentioned, uh, binary prediction is correct. So let's go ahead and just reselect that. Now, again, walking through the wizard, and um, we're asked what we would like our buyer outcome that we're most interested in. And for this example, we're interested in this value representing a one, which means that the individual will be a buyer, so the value being true. Okay. Now, the match labels are freely optional to us in terms of if we get a correct match, what do we want to label it? Let's just label it buyer. If we get an incorrect match or a mismatch, let's go ahead and label it not buyer. Okay. Now let's go ahead and select next. Now, once again, uh, in the background, Power BI will be passing the data set and the, and the options that we've selected for our parameters, and it will be recommending to us which columns, which columns of data to select in our model that are going to correlate with us getting the outcome we want of an individual being a buyer. Now, this is generally fairly accurate, and in machine learning uh, and AI, generally, um, columns are referred to as features. Okay, so from this moment forward, I will just refer to them as features. And me being me, I'm just going to invoke a little bit of chaos and I'm going to ignore all of the recommendations and I'm going to select the majority of these columns. Okay, and you'll see the reason why after. So, generally, the reason that these columns aren't selected is that Power BI is recommending to us that they have a low correlation with the outcome of an individual being a buyer. Okay, So there's no point having them within the data set because they don't really, um, whether or not the person's a homeowner, homeowner or not, or sorry, number of cars owned, doesn't really correlate with the outcome of them purchasing from us. Okay, And we'll see that as we start to go through and build this model out. Let's go ahead and select next. And excellent. We can name our model, so let's again call it ML dash from. Uh, fun fact, I was actually born in Birmingham, so it's nice to be back here today. Dudley Wright Hospital, if anybody's familiar. Um, I don't come back too often, but it's nice to be back. Um, always leave a description, um, again, if not for your colleagues, for your future self. Um, I hope I have a future self, so I will just call this, this is a description, okay? Now, I don't know about yourselves, but I like to think that whenever I train and practice something, I tend to get better, okay, the longer I spend the time training and practicing. Now, it's generally the same for a machine learning model, okay? Generally, the longer you train, the longer you iterate over the data, identify patterns, test different models, the better the results you're going to get. Now, in Power BI uh, Premium and Premium Per User, we can go from, I believe it's one minute, let's just try this down to... It's down to five minutes and up to 360 minutes. OK, now Kieran's got to come on next and I know you all will get home this evening, so I'm going to set it down to five minutes. But ultimately, you could raise that all the way up to 360 minutes um, if you if you want to. OK, excellent. So what happens next? So what's going to happen under the hood uh, once we select save and train? You can just see here is um, it's going to train the model using 80 percent of our sales training data. OK. It's going to use the other 20% of the data of the data to go over um, uh, and predict the accuracy within the report after that. So let's go ahead and select save and train. And I make that six minutes um, in showing, and we've just built a machine learning model in Power BI Premium or Premium per user. Okay. Now what you'll notice um, just here, those of you familiar with um, um, with the service and uh, the data flow or data set refreshing is that all that's happening in the background is it's just refreshing, building out those predictions and training that model. Now, generally, I will stop here um, just for a couple of questions whilst it does do that. If anybody has any, I know it covers quite a bit. I just wanted to ask what difference training time makes, like, more training time or less time, what difference that makes? 
it allows the model to go over and iterate over the data. So that 80% sample of data is basically being um, processed, processed over again and predictions being tested against it. Now, depending on how those tests go and the quality of those predictions, um, is, is the model going to end up with at the end? So if you're only doing it for five minutes, you're limited in the amount of iterations and the tests. Whereas if you do that for 360 minutes, you can get, for example, I don't know, 300 um, predictions and tests as opposed to around 32 in five minutes. So does it affect the accuracy of it? It does, yes. So if you give it less time, then the R code is not reliable? And I wouldn't say it's not reliable. It's less reliable um, than it would be if you predict for a longer period of time. Now, there is a plateau to this as well. So depending on, and this is very depending on the data that you're dealing with and the predictions you're trying to run as well. So you may find that if you step outside of Power BI and you run a machine learning model overnight, for example, it doesn't make any difference than running it for five hours. Um, so it really depends on the underlying data set. But generally with where we are and what we're doing in Power BI today, Training it for a longer period of time will give you more accurate predictions than the less time. Do you have like five rows? So it's 360, but still trying to be 360. I've never tested it, but I believe the answer would be yes. Maybe the same number of I would suggest test it, um, but I, 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 would, I would hazard a guess that the answer would be yes. Uh, not in PPU. Um, so again, if you start trying to load um, like terabytes, petabytes of, of data, um, Power BI is not the place to do it. And I'll cover that a little bit later. Uh, but where we are, you shouldn't run into any issues with PPU. And if you are using data sets um, that require that much grunt, you shouldn't be in Power BI doing it. So the caveat with this session is, um, as I've said to the, at the top end, is this is really to walk you from being a Power BI developer, um, reporter, admin, et cetera, into starting to play around with machine learning. Um, and then if you are going to pursue it further, with tools like Azure ML, Python, OpenAI, et cetera, are your playground, there becomes a limit, and we'll get to that in the second half of the demo, whereby you, you shouldn't really be playing around with, um, with Power BI. Not, not out of the box, you're going through the wizards here. Um, obviously, there is if you're using your own scripts in, in Python and outside of, uh, of, the, of the service. But this is, like I say, really to walk you through from that beginner level into getting up and running in Power BI. Then my suggestion would be go into either Azure ML, bespoke Python solutions, or maybe even Azure Databricks, and then stepping outside of those realms as well. Excellent. Yes. Uh, I the advice or I'm going to the other for like, the number of changes. Yes. If they are playing, uh, the model will do the accuracy of the seed because of the reset. So, because, so if, I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, the model will return to us based on the features we selected. So if we take features out, we'll get different predictions. If we add further features in or change the data, the predictions will change as well. Um, generally, I would hazard a guess as well that even if we run this this model again directly after, the predictions would be slightly different as well. So, sorry. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough one to answer because what, what you're getting into the realms of there is something called feature engineering, um, which again, I would say that you wouldn't, it's, it's more advanced than what we're covering at this moment in time. So because we're using the UI to select, my recommendation would be just select the ones that Power BI recommends to you that has a high correlation with the outcome. I've only selected the other ones just to show you when we get into the reporting aspects, why Power BI is correct in recommending those not to be selected. Um, I would say when you're getting into feature selection, and we haven't touched on um, values being missing within columns, um, it's more for an advanced stage, not with where we are for this session. I'll take one more if that's okay, and then we'll jump back in because we've got a lot to cover. So yes, Tom. Yes. Yeah, 
So again, what I was just here is this is this is an art of the possible session. OK, so with this, you're looking at overfitting model drift. All of these elements start to creep in uh, when you get a bit more advanced in machine learning, etc. Um, so I will give that caveat because it's been raised. Um, this is not a set and forget. OK, so you can't just load your data in, run your machine learning model. Things change. OK, um, you might have new buyers that come in every month. Um, the data sets might change, um, so you have to really continue to iterate over this. Um, as you mentioned, overfitting um, as well. So this is really just an art of the possible as opposed to a deep dive. Okay. Happy to come back again in the future and do a bit more of an advanced session if there's a need for it as well. OK, we will have time uh, hopefully at the end for um, some more questions as well. OK, um, OK, so that is still refreshing, but what I should be able to do here is jump into a previously deployed version. training report um, so just bear with us a moment just while this loads now what happens after you've trained um, your prediction model is you're generating a report in terms of how the how the performance was for the model predictions now this is a power bi report okay now again i'm really going to gloss over this um, as more of an overview than than a deep dive so we have three different report pages so i'm just going to go back to model performance now, what I mentioned to you, actually, before we do that, so we have um, what's known as an area under the curve or an AUC. Again, just to kind of caveat this, you're looking for between 70 and 100% for good performance or seven to 10, depending on what you're using. Um, now, we also get this tab here, which is to see top predictors. Now, if we look at our top predictors, what it's giving us is an overview in terms of um, the makeup of our bias. Okay, so let's, for example, select age. Now we can start to see um, that generally um, our bias, let's just say our bias are between 46 and 59. Okay, because that's the highest percentage of individuals that, that buy from us. Okay. Similarly, the marital status is generally single, total number of children is generally one. And then as you can start to see here in top predictors by influence, it starts to tail off quite rapidly, which is why Power BI was correct in terms of not recommending us to select those columns because it's a low correlation. OK. Now I'll just close that. Now I will touch very briefly on um, this matrix just here. OK, now what this is called is um, a confusion matrix, and I'm just going to get a really quick image up okay now the best way to read a confusion matrix is using something like this okay now for us we're looking for high values in the top left because what that means is it's a true positive prediction it's a tr it's a correct prediction of an individual being a buyer okay also we're looking at a true negative so this is a correct prediction that an individual will not be a buyer OK, outside of this, we have false negatives and false positives. But again, don't worry too much about those at this stage. And um, going back, we can see that in our top left, we have quite a high um, number in terms of an accurate prediction. And we don't have any for inaccurate. And we have um, actual not buyers, so a, a, a false negative. Again, not uh, very high as well. Now, we have something available to us, which is recall and precision. Again, without going too in depth, I'll just show you what happens if we increase the precision and lower the recall. You'll notice now that we have um, a high value of um, positive, um, negative predictions. Um, so individuals that are not buyers with us. OK, now generally a good starting point is around 0 0.5. OK, and then you can work away from that. Now, I won't go into cost benefit analysis again for the purpose of today's session. Um, I will also not go too in depth over accuracy report, and I'll just go into training details. So this to answer the question in the front here earlier is the amount of uh, iterations and the change of model quality uh, within those iterations. We can also see um, the final model being used, which is a pre fitted soft voting classifier. We can see that the number of iterations run um, was 32, 
and where our maximum model quality ends up at the end um, as well, given the allotted time that it's been able to run for. OK, fantastic. Um, we are now absolutely done in the service. We've generated um, our machine learning model. All that's left to do is go ahead and apply the model to our leads. OK, so if you are doing this and following along at home, you would just select apply model. OK. We would then look for our prospective buyer data. This is this is our lead data. We would select that. We can label the column whatever we would like. I'll just leave it as buyer prediction for now. And you can see that we've left our um, threshold is 0 0.5. Now, when you go ahead and select save and apply, OK, um, I won't do that because it's already been previously deployed. You'll be presented back to this screen here, OK, which is our data flow. Now you remember we started with two tables, OK, one being our sales training data, the second being our prospective buyer data, so our lead data. We now have the additional buyer prediction training data, which is at 80 percent of our training data. We have our testing data, which is the remaining 20 percent, and we have the table that we're most interested in, which is our prospective buyer enriched with the buyer prediction. So this is our lead data, but now with our predictions applied. We also have explanations, and this just goes into more details in terms of why the machine learning model predicted the way they wanted to. OK, for the purposes of reporting, what we will do is load up Power BI desktop. Um, let's go for a new report. What we're going to do is connect directly to our data flow, pull in that data set and see those predictions now. Hopefully the demo gods will play nicely and we'll be able to connect and the Wi-Fi will hold out for us. Excellent. So let's go to the familiar get data. We're going to want to connect to a data flow. Uh, let's just go to data flows at the top here. Select connect. Okay. Now it's just opening up our workspaces. Uh, I apologize. Um, I did sign in before this session. But I will sign in again. Anybody wants my email, just note down this one. <laughs> OK, excellent. We're going to use our sandbox. Uh, I'm going to use the previously deployed one because I'm guessing that ML Brum's still running. And we want our enriched buyer prediction data. OK. Um, I will go to transform just so we can really see this um, very quickly. I'm going to attempt to stay on time. OK. Now you'll notice this is our, um, our lead data, so we still have our uh, transactional keys at the beginning. Now, if we just scroll to the right hand side, we now have an additional set of columns which have the prefix of buyer prediction. OK, so we have our outcome column, which is our prediction. OK, we also have that prediction score. Now, this is a score between 0 and 100. The closer to 100, the more accurate the prediction, the lower the value, the less accurate the prediction. And then we have some other columns, which is the explanation. Um, also, we have um, the explanation index again wouldn't generally need these for reporting purposes. Let's go ahead and close and apply. This is a really small data set, so it shouldn't take too long. I know everybody's familiar with waiting for data to load in, in Power BI. So. Excellent. OK, and then we're going to make a really rudimentary report. So for all of you visualization specialists, don't judge me. Come and join us in the um, data DNA visualization challenge. With a chance to win some money, OK? So what I've done here is I've just added our lead, first name, last name, um, the prediction, uh, the prediction outcome and also the scoring waiting for that as well. Before I do that, there is going to be a summarization on bio prediction, so I'm just going to remove that. And I'm going to add in a very rudimentary slicer. OK, just so we can see, OK, 
let's take a look at those individuals which have been predicted to become a buyer for us and let's set that with the prediction score descending so ultimately those with the most accuracy um, have ended up with a buyer and we can just give this to our sales team and say right this is what our machine learning model says should buy from us go and make your calls ultimately we can do the same for those that are predicted not to be buyers as well okay and we can say to our lead company give us back 1.5 million however many much and or give us some leads that match these profiles okay so that's how uh, we can take a look at sales leads in power bi premium or premium per user but i'm very aware not everybody here has access to premium or premium per user so how can we do the same for free um, so it is possible to begin with. Um, now, this is highly technical, uh, so I'm going to gloss over a lot of this uh, alongside the time we have remaining. And this is going to be more of a just you can do it um, as opposed to let's walk through how it's done. OK, um, so there's a couple of caveats with this approach um, and limitations. So there's no machine learning ops or ML ops available with this option. Um, you can only use the personal gateway uh, currently, and it becomes very difficult to manage dependencies, and this is no way, shape or form scalable. OK, so if you are going to start taking on these types of approaches, Power BI no longer become, becomes the place to do it. OK. So to do this, we need to install some alternative tools. Now, the QR code on the screen is for the GitHub repo, um, so please feel free if you do want to scan that, do it now or following the session. Um, I am going to go through this quite quickly, so please feel free to come and see me after because we do want to stay fairly on time. OK, um, so first and foremost, there's a tool called Anaconda. Now, Anaconda is by far the easiest way to get your machine up and running for Python and R implementations. So I would recommend it. It's, it's absolutely free to install. And to do our machine learning, we're going to use um, a library called PyCarrot. Now, PyCarrot again is freely available, it's open source, um, and it's going to enable us to go from our data to deploying a model very, very quickly. OK, now we do have a couple of technical aspects to enable this. And again, I can share with you after where to get Anaconda from, and you may need to get some Microsoft C++ build tools, uh, but I do apologize. We just need to stay on time, so just reach out to me after I can go through all this. OK. So once you've installed Anaconda, you'll be presented with something called the Anaconda prompt. OK, now I don't really like coding too much in demos because we all know it can go wrong. So I'm literally going to give you three lines of code. OK, um, so what you'll notice is the Anaconda prompt. And sorry, it's not sharing my screen for some reason. But this might be a similar issue that we had earlier. So I might need to stop presenting in the group and let's just see what happens here. Try again. Okay, just bear with, I'll take it out of presenter mode. Okay, we should be okay. Right, so. Perfect. OK, so we load up Anaconda command prompt and just take this as containers. And if you're not familiar with what containers are, just refer to them as folders on your, on your desktop. OK, so you'll notice at the beginning, the first word is base. OK, this means that we're in our base container, base directory or base folder. OK, now I always recommend creating different environments or containers for, for how you want to work with your data. So for this example, we're going to use um, a predefined environment called data science underscore UG by entering activate data science underscore UG. And you'll notice we've changed from our base container to our DS container, OK? Next, we need to make sure that we have PIP installed. Now, PIP is a library manager, OK? So to do this, uh, it's exactly the same as having, I don't know, um, App Store and iTunes, those type of environments, Google Play, etc. So to do this, again, three words, Conda um, install pip. OK, now what will happen is it will go away, find uh, our pip library and install it for you. It should already be on this system, so it should do it very quickly. It might take longer installing it for the first time in your environment. OK. 
again, it will just go through and resolve this. Excellent. Um, and then finally, we want to use pip to install high carrot. OK, so once we have pip our app store installed, we're just installing one of our apps, which is pi carrot. Um, again, all that's saying is that all of the requirements are already satisfied, which means it's already installed. It might take a little bit longer on your system. Excellent. We now have a Python environment fully up and running and operational uh, for us to be able to go and do machine learning in. OK, now we just need to make Power BI aware of it. So let's head back over to Power BI. We want to go to File, Options and Settings, Options. And then in here we have Python scripting. OK, now in here we want to just select other as the detected Python home library. And you'll notice we're now pointing to my Anaconda environment where we have data science underscore UG as that environment. Go ahead and select OK. And Power BI is now aware of where your Python environment is and where all of your libraries exist. OK, excellent. Now, in an effort to stay on time, I'm going to go to a predefined version of this and gloss over some of it. So what we can do is in your in your traditional get data. So I will just show you this element because it is slightly different. We can go to get data. We want to use um, the web connector as opposed to text CSV. So the difference between Power Query Online. OK. Again, you will just pull in your raw URL, hit OK. Power Query Online will go ahead, pass that information that's been presented to it. Now, again, a difference in desktop and Power Query Online, as you'll notice, it doesn't identify the first row as headers. If you follow this process through, it also doesn't define the data types either. So there are some differences between Power Query Online and Power BI Desktop. OK, now once you have that data loaded in, you'll be presented with a couple of screens. OK, so we have our lead data and our sales training data. Now, again, we'll go back to our source. We've already gone through promoted headers and we've changed our data types like I've just mentioned. Now, at that moment, we want to start running some Python scripts. So we want to use transform. And we want to select run Python script. OK, now. Normally selecting this, it would insert a step. We already have a Python script step here. So what will happen is you'll be presented with this screen. OK, this is the most rudimentary IDE. Uh, for those of you familiar with IDEs, it's basically just a text box. Um, so I recommend that you create your Python scripts somewhere else outside of Power BI. OK, but you can copy and paste them directly into here. OK, without getting too bogged down into the technicalities, I'm just going to go back to. Our GitHub and you'll notice that we have four different Python scripts, OK? They're labeled one, two, three and four to make it nice and easy to follow if you do follow through with this. And each of these scripts, again, at a very high level is performing a different task. OK, now what's happening in this script? Is that to to use PyCarrot as a library, you have to encode your features. OK, now the easiest way to describe this is that if you have a column which has two values in it, this data set, the gender is male and female, it will encode male, for example, to 0, 0.0, and it will encode female to 1.0. So it will replace all of those values. OK, now it's going to do that in this script for the whole data set. And then it will give us back every data frame, which is just a table that's created after that. OK, now I will very briefly show you. How that's changing the data. And gender is a good column to see it on because you can literally see the difference in 1.0 and 0, 0.0 to represent the two encoded values. And it does this for all of the features um, within this data set. So that's our first script. It prepared the data set for, for the machine learning within PyCurrent. Now, next, we want to go over to our second script, okay, which is aptly named script two, train data set for ML. And within this script, all we're doing is building out that machine learning model that we built out in, in the cloud service using the wizard guide walkthrough. OK, we're just doing a scripted version of that now. OK, 
So again, what you would do is you would select run Python script because you're adding another step in Power Query, which will generate this screen. Then you um, paste your code in directly from our GitHub, and then it will give you back. Try. Uh, this is because I was rushing and I didn't let the, the previous preview finish. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, but what will happen is it will run through, build that machine learning model in the background. And the difference is here, it will actually apply the predictions directly to the sales training data set. OK, now the reason it does this is we actually store an object out as part of this script, which is our machine learning model that we then reference to apply to our lead data. OK, so what would happen is we've loaded our lead data. Now we're going to follow through exactly the same pattern. Uh, we've promoted our headers and um, changed our data types. And again, we're now ready to run a Python script. OK, so you select run Python script, generate our rudimentary ID. We head over to script free. Now script free again is doing exactly the same thing. It's encoding that data um, to those encoded values so that we can actually run a machine learning model on it. You hit OK. We then go over to our imputed table. And hopefully a power query plays ball. You'll just again see those encoded values um, on, on our features. So again, if I scroll over to our gender column, it becomes very apparent. So just gender again, we only have two gender values in this data set. Um, and then again, we're ready to run our final Python script which is our small list, but most powerful. So script four. OK, now you'll notice this is just seven lines of code with comments. OK, all we're doing here is calling that object, which holds our machine learning model predictions and applying it to our final data set. OK. And finally. We can hit OK and in the background that will go and run the machine learning model now. Because of these, because this data set, you'll notice that all of the values are encoded. I didn't just go and do some remerging to pull back in our first, last names, etc., to give us a bit of a cleanse the data set. And I'll come out of here now so we can just see how that's been applied. And our final data set will look something like this. OK, so we want to look at our lead data. We'll select our first name, last name, our um, label, which in this outcome is the prediction and our scoring. Make that bigger, we'll re add in our rudimentary filter. OK, and we'll select those which the machine learning model believes are true. And again, set that to the sending. So now again, uh, using Python, we have a list of leads which are likely to convert according to our machine learning model. And ultimately, we do the converse of that, which is um, leads that are not likely to become buyers for us as well. Again, we can go and give this to our sales team um, and give them back if not. Just really for, for completion as well, just so we've covered all aspects within Power BI. The final point to make is that you will notice that when we ran through those Power Query sets, it was fairly slow. OK, in terms of loading the data, transforming it, etc., and also calling the Python libraries. The reason we've done that is so you can see how every step iterates and changes the data. Generally, I'd recommend that you just use a, a, a separate script. OK, so you build your Python script and you call that script as a, as a data source with all your transformations in. So we do have that. It is available on, on the GitHub for completeness. Um, it's just called. Question. Python end-to-end -end ML, OK? And it's really simple and easy to call. So we have our Python underscore leads table here. You'll just select your data source as a Python script. And you'll notice now we only have two steps. So the source and navigation, OK? And we just loaded that data in, in about a second. And that performs every single step on both of those tables as opposed to pulling in everything. And you'll just see finally, those values represented as well if we just call in that table. So let's go to Python leads, first name, last name, label, score. Okay. Rudimentary slicer again. 
and ultimately you'll notice that um, we were able to do exactly the same thing, but just using a Python script as opposed to uh, multiple steps. So with that, this works again this time. Excellent. We now have a vision. Um, yes, I'm a Marvel fan. And Marvel fans, DC fans. Yeah. Uh, John, let me down. There's never any DC fans. Um, OK, so how can we take it to the next level? So we can then start looking at outlier detection, topic distribution, association, rule mining, etc. And we do have some more resources um, available. I would recommend um, by fellow MVP Luca Zavarella, Extending Power BI with Python and R. Fantastic book. Um, KD Nuggets, if you're interested in data science, again, fantastic resource, as is towards datascience.com. Um, outside of that, Anaconda for the Anaconda distribution. Um, and Microsoft also has some fantastic documentation available as well. Um, with that, I will close. Um, please do come and see me if you want to get the slides, etc. They're all available on the GitHub. If there are any questions, we can we can run. I've got a question. So at the start, I mean, there's a lot of you, but the start bit, you have the time allocation. Yeah. So I imagine if the, if you've got more data, if the tool isn't good at five minutes, there's no point running it for three hundred minutes because it's not going to change that much. Because it, you know, you know, what I mean, if the model doesn't work, <laughs> if, if it doesn't work, it it, it does. Is that why we've got the Time frame. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult question to answer because what we're doing here is we're using um, a single data set. Now, this could be very different for a different data set. Um, so I would suggest at that point starting to look into feature engineering um, and really just A-B testing uh, with different features from that perspective. But it's, 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 it's quite difficult to, uh, to answer on a different data set. That's why I'll just yeah. guess. And then after that, we have the, the different variables we could select. So oh, there's yeah, almost the categorical variables. So if you thought any question box, for instance, if you include like palliative care coding and not including it, it'll introduce the palliative in that if it's not introduced, the results will be high if you want to code it compared to the earth code it. So that makes sense. And then are we saying we only do the parametric tests and we don't do the non parametric So if the data is not normally distributed, it won't automatically select the right analysis. Is that correct in premium? Yes, exactly. So you have to bear in mind that what your inputs is what's going to be used to run the prediction model. If you introduce or remove data, um, the machine learning model will run again and you can introduce or even remove fallacies that can exist in there as well. And do you get exactly the same results using Python compared to Power BI Premium? Because no. I think you do more like correlation analysis and possibly a nice one, but at that level, because you didn't have any 0.9 in your first fits or the negatives, but you did in the second, and I think 0.85 was the highest the last time, and this time you had 0.9 lines. Yeah, exactly. So for those of you that are keen eyed, um, you'll notice that the predictions according to the Python script um, were more, it, 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 it had more accuracy. Okay. Um, this gets into the point in terms of when to use Power BI for machine learning. Um, if you want my honest answer, it's never. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 that gateway, okay? So it's to get you started off with machine learning, understanding different concepts, really moving on, and you'll soon out, you'll soon out, outgrow it, okay? When you do outgrow it, don't go down the route of the, what I showed you with desktop. Go into you can still use the same scripts, but do them either. Um, locally, deploy using DevOps, Databricks, etc. Um, the restriction here is I'm showing you everything in Power BI. Um, at that point, you really want to escape out of it. Okay. Okay. One more question, please. Yes. Yeah. Can you perform hyper tuning? Sorry, can you say that again, please? Can you perform hyper tuning? Oh. No. Oh. no. So um, in Power BI, premium and premium per user, you're, it's a black box. Okay. So every result, every, every pretty much everything I walked through. On the screen with a couple more options is what you have access to. Um, again, so at this point, it really, it's using um, Azure ML under the hood anyway. Um, so at that point, like I say, you're, you're best to just move over to Azure ML. Um, but you're really limited in terms of what you can and can't do uh, by the Power BI service. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Everyone will take a little break.
Yeah, we're going to yeah. 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 Well, any more questions? Yeah. Yes. So, um, what I walked through in the service was so excuse me. Uh, it recommended to us the binary prediction model, uh, but then we chose select a different model, and we had um, both regression and I forget the second one, um, doing classification one in regression available to us. So we have access to those three models to, so to, to select. Yes, to select from. Yeah. Um, again, like I say, th there becomes a point when you want to break out of the restrictions. Yes, please. So I want to go back to one because I've gone back to the data set, which is the data set. <coughs> the best way to start centralizing you can see mining data sets in terms of specific centers that should be using just for a training data set. This on the training data set is going to be training models going to retain 20% of that training data set to do some predictions to see if the training data set works. Yeah. So these are a good um, percentage point where I need to slice my existing data into those you know, uh, data for, for predicting and data for training. Yeah. You're going to hate me this, John, but it depends. Yeah. <laughs> now, it really depends. So in part of the premium or premium per user, you're restricted to 80%. Uh, to train 20 percent to test that's a given whenever you use those scenarios now outside of that you're going to have to really work with the data you may find that you want to use 60 percent and then 40 percent to to test predictions on 70 30 etc um so at that point it does depend but in probably our premium or premium per user you've got no um no choice unfortunately question in terms of explainability that's usually the, the holy grail of any machine learning model yes can you figure out why the model is predicting something. I think it had some colors there in our query. So again, we, help you understand that. we do get we do get explanations. Um, does it help is 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 the question. It depends who your audience is. Yeah. So will it help the developer? Then yes, I think you can answer your questions. But if you put it in front of a business user or a stakeholder, they're going to look at you and ask, what are you presenting to me? So again, um, be mindful of your audience. If you are going to if you are going to use explanations and run Power BI, then um, I would recommend that you probably lean on something like ChatGPT um, to say, give me a prompt. Why um, can you explain this to a non-technical person, stakeholder for me, and then let it spin it out and take that to the end user? Be the answer. Right. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. 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 I can give you one off the top, the straight off the top of the head, uh, data quality. Um, so whenever, and we have so many conversations, right? So I know you had an open AI session here not too long ago, ChatGPT. I was going to do um, a session on, on GPT models um, today as well. Like the world is a buzz um, with AI, and I'm sure that where you all work and in the conversations that you have, everybody is asking you for how can we implement um, ChatGPT or are you using ChatGPT? Um, and the problem with this is that um, companies are, are moving towards these type of technologies with carelessly, uh, with, 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 with no caution to the wind. And the real fundamental is data quality. Um, like we like we said before, model drift um, is a big thing um, as well in, in machine learning models. So you have to make sure that you're keeping up to date, um, reiterating feature engineering. It's not just a set and forget. I try to keep it. I mean, this is. This, this is still a fairly complex um, demo, even though it's kept as simple as possible, and we're really just scratching the surface. Um, so explaining that to stakeholders, um, really I would just keep on saying data quality, data quality, data governance, data management. Um, all of these three pillars really enable everything that comes after it. So I would say DQ. Uh, Cynthia mentioned you like regression. When you run logistic regression models, you ever use any statistical process control charts at the same time? But how do you like to visualize it? Unfortunately, I don't. I I, very, I rarely do dev anymore. Oh, uh, no, right. no. So uh, for me now, it's 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 about the more commercial aspects, maybe some demos, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm not devin as much as as much as I used to at all. So um, <laughs> unfortunately, oh, unfortunately and unfortunately, it means I get out a little bit more. <laughs> 
Right, everyone, let's give Leon a break. Maybe do we have food outside now? Yeah, right. I suggest we take a 10 minute break, then if everyone wants to catch up with uh, Leon in a break, yep. free to do it. Yeah, we back in 10 minutes, everyone. Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. 